morning and welcome to Sunday School. We were sorry to miss you last Sunday, but today we're going to combine last week's lesson and this week's lesson together. And hopefully we can uh, do this so that you can follow along. But first, before we start, we're going to pray to the Lord for his help. Lord, we come to you and thank you for the privilege that we have to open your word again. And we pray that you would help us to have ears to hear what you have to say. And work in each one of our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so today we're going to talk about the tabernacle on our first part of our lesson. And Jesus being the high priest and the mediator. But to start out, to help us to understand some of the story, we're going to look at this police car. And you probably have even recognized this building downtown Ottawa and these cars that are all over the place. But do you think that you would be okay to get in this car and drive away in it? What do you think? Can you drive a police car? Are you allowed to? Well, we know that we're not, right? You have to be a policeman that's hired by the city of Ottawa police and in order to be able to drive that car. And so when we think about the tabernacle, there's some things that you had to be eligible to do in there that had to happen according to God's design daily and yearly. So let's look at this tabernacle here. This was something that God instructed his people to build while they wandered in the desert. And after they came into the promised land until Solomon built the temple. And this tabernacle was like a, a wall around a courtyard that had things in it. And then there was a tent building inside it, which you can see toward the back. And in that, there was a court and then there was another inner court called the Holy of Holies, or the Most Holy Place. Only the priests were allowed to go into the Holy Place. And an Israelite would bring an offering or a sacrifice uh, of an animal to the court of the temple. And he would bring that to, to be sacrificed for his sins. And he would pass the guilt onto the animal and then... The animal was killed and the priest would sprinkle the blood on the altar as a representative worship worshiper the priest washed his hands in this big pot called the labor to show that the clean life should follow the forgiveness of sins and then the priest entered the holy place passing the lampstand at the table of bread and approached the altar of incense where incense where prayer was offered but then there was a high priest, as you can see in the next picture. Here we have the, uh, the map of the holy place, and the most holy place. And then there was a high priest. The high priest was called a high priest because he had a special thing that he did. And he inherited this position and he usually kept that position until he died. But the high priest was only allowed into the inner court or the holiest place once a year on the Day of Atonement. And the high priest went there yearly to pay the annual penalty for his own sins and those of his family and of the people. This happened once a year. He couldn't just go in there if he wasn't the high priest. Just like you couldn't just go drive a police car if you're not a policeman that's hired by the city. So if we look, um, he was to go inside, and he was to go to this place, as you can see in this picture, there was the Ark of the Covenant in the middle of the room there, and on top of the Ark of the Covenant, there was a thing called the Mercy Seat. And he went there each year with blood, and he sprinkled that blood on the Mercy Seat. Now, we learned about Elohim Kadoshim, the Holy God, and a sinful man has no right to stand in the holy presence of God, as we learned. So God, up, God had set up this sacrificial system, and he has the right. Who, who can go in? He can determine who can go in there and do this thing that signified payment for sins while God's people were practicing these sacrifices in the wilderness and when they came to the promised land as well. So we have... Another high priest, though, that we want to talk about, and that's Jesus. Jesus was a perfect high priest, and he 
was a sinless high priest, other priests had to offer sacrifices for their own sins before they could offer any sacrifice for anyone else. But Jesus didn't have any sin. He was sinless. And what was the sacrifice that Jesus brought? He didn't bring blood from an animal. He brought his own blood. And so we have this verse says, Christ came as high priest of the good things that have come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. So Jesus came as God's high priest, and he brought not the blood of an animal, but his own blood. So he was both the high priest and the blood sacrifice. And the Bible calls him our great high priest. Now one of the very neat things about this sacrifice that Jesus made is that it didn't have to happen daily. It didn't have to happen yearly even. It was a once for all sacrifice. So listen to this verse. Such a high priest truly meets our need one who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners. Unlike other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. Although uh, the, the priests offered daily sacrifices and the high priest made atonement payments for sin, in the Holy of Holies every year, it didn't last. They had to go back every year. But Jesus did it once, and it lasts forever. And listen to this verse. Now there have been many of those high priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those to, who come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede for them. In these verses that we've been reading, we can find in Hebrews chapter 7 and chapter 9. So, what happened when Jesus was on the cross? It says in Matthew, or in Mark 15, verse 37 and 38, With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. Well, imagine a curtain that was torn in two, like that, from the top to the bottom. Now something interesting about this curtain was this separated the people from coming directly into the presence of God, because God is holy and people are not. But this curtain was really thick. It was like the thickness of my hand across here. And that curtain ripped from the top to the bottom. It looked like of its own accord. But God tore it so that we could have access to the most holy place. And what is the most holy place? That's the presence of God. And we can go there any time now because Jesus, who is the mediator, as you see in this slide, the mediator, he's the mediator, the one that went between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, it tells us. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, it says, There is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus. He made the way so that he could represent us to God and we can go directly into God's presence without any interference. We have the right. He gave us the right to become his children and he welcomes us into our, his presence. But first of all, we need to put our trust in Jesus. He didn't do that just so that everyone in the world is automatically has access. You have to have the right. God gives the right. When you put your trust in Jesus and the work that he did at the cross, he gave himself as a sacrifice for sins for you and me so that we could come to him, confess our sins, that we're sinners, and put our trust in him. And he has opened the way to God so we can have access at any time.
Now let's go to lesson 28. This lesson is about a cornerstone. And we're going to talk about what that means, the cornerstone. But let's suppose that you are involved in running a long race. Here we have a picture of a map and it goes through a course. See the start line and finish line and it goes through all these streets around Riverside. You know where Riverside is in Ottawa? We have Riverside Hospital. We have two rivers in Ottawa that come together. Maybe three if you go on the other side of the border. And these rivers uh, are neat places to run. And so here was a race that was set up. And <clears throat> there are different places along the route that you would encounter different things. And maybe even things that would distract you. And you might need to have, you know, some of that. Some water. You bring a water bottle along when you get sweaty and thirsty. And you also might see signs that say, you know, turn this way or that way. You might also want to have something to wipe the sweat. You know, you might get really sweaty, like this boy, and need to wipe your face. You might come around a corner and see there's people standing there cheering you on. And um, there might be people, you know, jumping up and down, cheerleaders with pom-poms and that kind of thing. But what if you come along for a while and you see a detour sign? You can't go this way. You have to go that way. And you think, well, the detour is going to cost me time and I don't really want to lose the race. And so I think maybe I'm going to just hop over the, the barrier at the detour and um, I'll get there faster than following the detour. But what if it turns out that uh, you took the, you didn't take the detour, you jumped over and you didn't realize that as you ran really fast around a curve that there was, the road was washed out and in, in uh, where the bridge was over the river and you fell down a steep bank and got really hurt. That wouldn't be so good, right? It, it could end in a disaster and that would be really sad. But those who actually followed the detour, all of them, they actually uh, finished the race. And uh, what a wonderful thing that was for them to be able to finish the race. And so the Lord Jesus, he says, um, I am laying in Zion a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe but for those who do not believe, the stone that builders rejected has become the cornerstone, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. So it was like the race, these people in the Old Testament. We're going to talk about a story that happened in the vineyard. But before we do, we're going to sort of set the stage for a cornerstone. Back in Bible days when buildings were built, they put a cornerstone that had a lot more significance than cornerstones that we see on buildings today. Cornerstones we see on buildings today are decorative, really, and they might even have the date when the building is was built. You can next time you go to the Met, maybe you can look at what we call a cornerstone at the front of the building, and it shows when the building was built or when it was open. And for the Met, that was about 12 years ago. And you can have a look at that. But in the in Bible times, they chose a really strong stone because it was the place where the building was started and all the building kind of fit together and hung on that stone. And it had to stay in place. It had to be strong. It had to be big enough. It couldn't be crumbly. So this stone um, comes from a story. There's a story about it, actually, in Mark chapter 12. And verses 1 to 11. So if you could follow along in your Bible, we could even look at that. And so we find in this story that a man planted a vineyard and he leased it out to people who were going to take care of it, or tenants. And when the harvest was ripe, the owner, he sent a servant to get his share of the produce. But the tenants beat the servant up and sent him away with nothing. So the owner sent another servant and they hit him on the head. 
and they treated him shamefully. And then the third, third servant, it says they killed him. And many others were sent. Some they beat and some they killed. So finally the owner decided to send his son. He thought, surely the tenants would respect the son. But instead of respecting the son, the tenants killed him. And they thought they could take his inheritance. So Jesus finished that parable by stating that the owner of the vineyard would come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. And then he finished with this verse. Have you not read this scripture that the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? And this was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Well, who are the tenants in the parable? Who's Jesus referring to? So he's talking about um, messages that the prophets brought to God's people in the Old Testament. And they sent them away, and they hurt them, and they killed them. And then Jesus finally came. And he was the cornerstone, the real cornerstone. And people rejected him too. But it says that as many of us that did receive that cornerstone, Jesus, he's the one that came to bring salvation. And he's either a stone that people cling to for refuge, and he doesn't move. He's there forever. He's the one that gave us forever salvation. Or he's a stone that we trip on. Or stumble over what kind of a stone is he to you but Jesus is not an unnecessary barrier like some of the people running the race thought by the riverside and they jumped over it only to their own peril but he's the lifesaver like this lifesaver we have in the picture here he's the one who was rejected by the builders that we read about but he's the one who is the one is the, the cornerstone and the Savior. So it says there in the middle of that slide, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. What's this thing here, this big stone? This is crumbly sandstone. Now I know that we have in Canada, we have some really good sandstone, and some of our buildings are built out of sandstone. You can find some of those downtown when you look at some of the old buildings. We have limestone buildings, we have granite buildings, we have sandstone buildings. And these stones, you know, they they last a long time. But you can get crumbly sandstone, and that's the, the picture of this big rock is here, right, right here. And crumbly sandstone is not a good thing for a foundation to build anything on. And when we think about our life, is crumbly sandstone what we want to build our life on? something that doesn't last and it's something that doesn't endure or do we want to build it on the rock like jesus when we think about different kinds of stone that we even have here in canada sandstone or crumbly sandstone and granite granite is the one that's really strong like most of the hills around here are made out of granite it's strong and it endures and that's what jesus is like he's the chief cornerstone on which we can build our lives and I hope that you can find your faith and refuge in him and trust in him. I hope you enjoyed this lesson today. And we trust that you will uh, listen and follow God's word. And we'll look forward to talking to you again next week. Have a great week.